When I was 16, I got really sick. I was run down, working hard in school, not eating properly. And I got pneumonia. And an abscess developed on my lung. Well, one day the abscess burst and I hemorrhaged. I needed blood. Pretty sure everybody thought I might die. Obviously, I didn't. But some say that God saved me. Believers think God communicates to us through miracles, that miracles are proof of the divine. Now I'm going on a journey to discover the power of miracles. You fell from up there down to here. What did the doctor say? You are a miracle. To discover what's luck, and what is fate? In the Chinese thought, everything has a reason for why it occurred. To see how belief in miracles can change history. The miracles symbolize the beginning of the Jewish people. And how faith can change lives. You are looking at a true miracle of God. To achieve what appears to be impossible. The real miracle is to transform the human mind. That's the miracle we need. Most who believe in God believe God is watching over us. Every moment of every day, guiding us saving us. To me, it has to be a miracle that he can look out for all seven billion of us. So when I heard about Alcides Moreno, I had to come to New York and hear his story. Well, here we are. Eight years ago, Alcides came to work as a window washer at this 47-story tower in Manhattan. Tell me about it. What happened? And I wake up in the morning, take my car and commute from New Jersey and come to the building. You take the elevator. And go all the way to the top. The top is 47, 47 stories up. Stairs. Yes. And climb to the platform. Alcides had just begun to lower the platform when one of the two cables holding it snapped. I just grabbed the scaffold and I scroll up until another cable is snapped. Medics, they found them right in the middle. The scaffold like that. Between the two buildings? Yeah, between the two buildings, right. It was right in the middle. They picked me up from there. Alcides fell 47 stories, 500 feet. He broke 10 bones. His lungs collapsed. He needed 43 pints of blood and plasma. He spent three weeks in a coma. Do you remember the day you woke up from the coma? I wake up December 24th, right there in the bed, and my wife was there. A fall from just 10 stories is something hardly anyone survives. Doctors say Alcides' 47-story plunge was beyond belief. I've seen it all, or at least I think I have, until um, something like this happens. You fell from up there down to here. Yes. And here, here you are. 
Yes, sir. And look at that. Walking and everything. Give me a name for that. I mean, the doctor told me, you are a miracle, man. Say, you are a miracle. What do you think? I don't know. Still, I don't know. Alcides has a hard time accepting this as a miracle because he was not alone when he fell. His younger brother was on this platform with him. He died the moment he hit the ground. What was your brother's name? Edgar. Edgar. There we are. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yeah. Two faces, same. Very nice. My brother's a big loss to me. Were you close? Really, really close. That was a great man. I'm sorry, Alcides. It must be very painful. Yes. I just bring it to work with me to help it out. Mm. Because... He's younger? Oh, yes, that was younger than me. That was a good man. You think God saved you? I think so, yeah, I believe that, yes. So that makes you the miracle. But at the same time, your brother is gone, the yes. one you... Do you worry about that? Do you, do you try to reconcile that? Try to figure out why him, uh, not, me. not you? Why, well, yes. I ask him, why, why, what happened? Why? It was me. I would wonder every day. God gave me a second chance, I mean, to, to keep going, though. To keep going with my life. And I'm still looking forward to find out what exactly I have to do. Alcides is no longer a window washer. He and his wife have a new life in Arizona where they are raising their family. He's still trying to understand whether God has a plan for him. Why me? Does God have a purpose for me? Alcides wonders, why did I survive when my beloved brother did not? Why, I mean, is there some entity that makes that choice? Or is, uh, do we live with randomness, just pure, mindless randomness? For Christians, miracles are proof that life is not random. They believe God intervenes in the world for a reason. Jews also believe in the power of miracles. In fact, their faith was built on a bedrock of divine intervention. I've come to Jerusalem to see how Jews celebrate the miracles of their exodus from Egypt on a night that's different from all other nights. Passover. Hi. Hello there. How do you do? I'm very well indeed. This well, is for you. Thank you very much. And I'm Aviva. Welcome Hello, to my Aviva. home. You do. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh. <laughs> Rabbi Maya. Nice to meet you. How wonderful. Maya Leibovitch is the first Israeli born woman ever to become a rabbi. Yeah. yeah. I've known a few rabbis, I've never a lady. I hope you enjoyed the Seder, <laughs> and we'll do our utmost to make it... Uh... Food, I'll be okay. Food, yes. Oh, food, yes. <laughs> this is the um, haroset, and you get to taste it, and we're gonna decide if it... Okay. It's gotta make it feel, it's gotta make you feel as if you're getting drunk. Is it whiny enough? i gonna tell you the truth. I think it's enough. I think it's enough, too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, let's get started. Seido Pesach is starting. Come on, everybody sit down. One of the most important traditions in uh, Judaism, and this has been ordered to us from uh, our ancestors, uh, thou shall not speak on your cell phone during the Seder. 
So we have a cell phone basket here. <laughs> the month that we came out of Egypt is called in Hebrew Nisan. Nisan comes from the word Nisim, which is miracles. It's the month of the miracles, which will symbolize the beginning of the Jewish people as the people, as an entity. The way we go with the Seder is that uh, we, we read the, through the Haggadah. So uh, Morgan, as our guest, we would uh, welcome you to start with uh, the bread of affliction. This is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let all that are hungry enter and to eat, and all who are in want come and celebrate the Passover. This year we are slaves. Next year we shall be free men. The Passover meal is a celebration of the bond Jews feel with God. And it's an occasion for children to understand the foundation of their faith. The Seder recounts how the Jews escaped slavery. <laughs> thanks to God striking the Egyptians with a series of 10 plagues. So Rabbi, yes. why Passover? What is the word itself referred to? When God brought upon Egypt the 10th plague of killing the firstborn, he told the Israelites to put blood on the thresholds of their homes and the angel of death passed over the homes of the Hebrews and only took the firstborn of the Egyptians. Many Jews believe God's sparing of their children was proof they were his chosen people. But this was not the only divine sign. The miracle of getting out of Egypt was followed by the miracle of splitting of the sea. God made two miracles. One was splitting the sea before the Hebrews and then closing it before the Egyptians. So God wants us to remember the Egyptians are just his sons as we are. So by putting drops of um, wine on our uh, plates, we're actually putting drops of sorrow that God had lost so many of his children while saving the others. This acknowledgement that the Exodus miracles didn't benefit everyone reminds me of Alcides Moreno. Divine will is not easy to understand. So what is your take on the whole idea of the series of miracles? I don't think anybody's gonna split the sea for us today. I wish somebody would bring peace to us today, but the Bible is not a uh, book of history. The Bible is a book of ideas. The question is, what can we learn from it? What can we take into our own life? It's the way of saying thank you, you know? It's the way of teaching the kids that every small thing is not granted, that you need to say thank you. It's nice to have parents. It's lovely to have a roof above your head. That's probably the biggest miracle yeah. of all of them, that uh, yeah. Jews are still here. I want them to come out with the idea that miracles can happen. That's the story. The Israelites saw these miracles as proof that God cared about them. Not all modern Jews believe in the miracles of Passover, but these stories still define them as a people. And that deep well of tradition and moral strength has sustained them been called on by them for thousands of years to get them through hard times. Around the world, belief in miracles gives people strength. In Mexico City, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe marks the spot where the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared to a peasant 500 years ago. In Hong Kong, Buddhist pilgrims flock to the statue of Guanyin, who they hope will grant them medical cures, a spouse, or good grades. And in Rome, miracles can turn ordinary people into saints. 
I've come to the Vatican to understand how the Catholic Church verifies miracles. I think the first time I was at the Vatican was about 1983. I'm meeting Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, the head of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So let's talk just for a moment about miracles. Do miracles really exist? Well, for instance, Jesus walking on water? In the life of Christ, if you don't accept the miracles, it's impossible to understand. But each page of the gospel is a miracle of Christ. To consider a person a saint, the church needs a miracle. In order to have saints, you have to have miracles. Yes. Unless you are a martyr, the only way to sainthood is to be deemed responsible for performing two miracles after you die. Pope John Paul II became a saint in 2014 after two women who prayed to him after his death claimed to be miraculously cured, one of Parkinson's disease, another of a brain aneurysm. The Vatican spends years investigating these claims, sometimes decades. The church has a devil's advocate who goes, and whenever anybody uh, claims to have seen or experienced a miracle, the church sends the advocate to investigate. Yes, we have the advocates and have scientific people, special doctors, to, to prove that this, uh, this is a special intervention of God. So if I come and say I have experienced a miracle, would the church then say, okay, well, we'll check that out? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were to check. Does the hand of God really intervene? Not just in matters of life and death, but also in the ups and downs of our daily lives? Or does everything that happens happen by chance? What, if anything, governs the seemingly random moments that change our lives and send us into different directions. Like a poor boy from Mississippi ending up in Hollywood. I always loved the movies. Always dreamed I would be in them. I was a believer. And I actually made it. Now, was that a miracle? Most of us have a turning point in our lives, a pivotal moment where you wondered, how did this happen? Mine was 1989. I made three films, Lean On Me, Driving Miss Daisy, and Glory. Did I make it happen? Was someone up there calling the shots? Or was I lucky? To try to understand this, I've arranged to meet a psychology professor who thinks we often mistake random chance for miracles. Danny Oppenheimer. Nice to see you. How are you today? I'm good, and you? I'm good. Good. What are you doing? I'm flipping coins. Why? I'm looking for streaks. Streaks? Yeah, if you flip a coin enough times, you're gonna get a streak. Really? That's a lot of tails. Well, if I flip a coin twice and I get heads both times, is that miraculous? Uh, no. You do it 50 times and you get 60. That's a miracle. Well, yeah, if you get more than you flip, certainly. <laughs> but how rare does an event have to be before we would call it miraculous? One in a million, one in a billion? I'll choose billion. All right, one in a billion. Well, let's try something. All right. Jack of diamonds, mm -hmm. six of spades, yeah. king of spades, mm -hmm. two of hearts, seven of diamonds, and ace of spades. Is it miraculous to have gotten this sequence? No. I mean, it's just, just a random selection of cards off the deck. 
Well, right. But this particular sequence, starting with the jack, yeah. and then getting the six of spades, and then king of spades, it only happens one in about 14 billion times you draw six cards. So it's pretty miraculous by your one in a billion standard. So you're telling me that this is miraculous? Well, no. As you said before, it's just a random set of cards. What if it was first six digits of your social security number? What if it were the last six digits of your social security number? The first six digits of your phone number? Sometimes it's not actually miraculous. Sometimes it's just probability playing its uh, tricks on you. All right, so how do we include the divine? Because there are people who really do think that there is divine intervention in these kinds of interplays. Absolutely, and nothing I'm saying here rules out the possibility of the divine. The fact that probability predicts certain things doesn't mean that there can't be divine intervention. But miraculous things that are so unlikely that you think it can't happen by chance alone, they do happen, and they have to happen. It would be odd if they didn't, because with six billion people in the world, there are so many opportunities for something really unusual to happen. We would expect it to happen to some of them. Mm. 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 It's human nature to make a symphony out of the cacophony of events going on around us doesn't mean that divine providence doesn't exist. In fact, as I learned when I was in Rome, in the past, chance and God coexisted. The ancient Romans had a different take on miracles. Before they became Christians, Romans had many gods. They believed the gods controlled their fate and everything that happened was decided by them. Archaeologist Valerie Higgins tells me the gods even determined the outcome of sporting events. So we're here in the Circus Maximus. This mm -hmm. was the largest uh, circus in Rome, in fact, in the Roman Empire. And uh, this was where they did chariot racing. We are actually standing on the track. Yeah, the starting gates were down there, mm -hmm. and they would race through here up to the other end where they would turn around and then go back down that end, and they would do that seven times. At least a quarter of a million people could fit in here. Bedlam. So, yeah, right. So this was a place that was full of life and full of action. Well, it must have been uh, quite a lot like uh, modern-day horse racing, you know, mm -hmm. betting and wagering and... For sure, yes. We know there was lots of betting and lots of gambling. Gambling, particularly on dice games, was frowned upon because you were betting on the will of the gods. But widespread gambling began to change the way Romans thought about fate and opened the way for belief in miracles. How did gambling fit with the idea that your fate was already set no matter what you did, mm. you were going to wind up the way you were going to wind up. They did very much believe that their fate was uh, set, but, you know, it didn't make them passive. They certainly did everything they could to get the gods behind their riders. Well, I would ask, like, for instance, of a day of, of the big race, you know, mm. uh, and the ancient Romans were thinking, well, it's in the hands of the gods, but we need to know what the gods want. Right, how, right. How, how would we figure that out? How did they go about figuring out what the gods wanted? What the gods wanted? Well, you had to go to a priest who was specialized in this sort of thing. Just around the corner from the racetrack, hidden in an alleyway and down in a basement, Valerie takes me to see the remains of a temple that dates back to the third century, a place where Romans may have tried to twist the will of the gods. This is spectacular. Yes, it is. What we're coming into now is a Mithraeum. Mithraeum. Yeah, that's right. It's a special kind of ritual space mm -hmm. for uh, the cult of Mithras. He's the god. He's killing the bull. Mithras was a god for men. Tough men, soldiers, powerful businessmen. So we're here in this Mithraeum, which is kind of like the original man cave. We know they did a lot of feasting. Would there be any of the uh, 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 
priest down uh, here. There would be them. priests down here, yes, I think for sure, um, who would be overseeing the feasting because it was quite essential that you did the ritual, you know, correctly to ensure that your team was going to be successful in the Circus Maximus. So here we are down here and we're doing all of the rituals. And so are we really trusting? to take care of what we want taken care of, or do we do a little... No, that doesn't stop you giving Fate a helping hand. Uh, certainly, we know there was a lot of cheating that went on uh, in the Circus Maximus. No. Oh, I'm afraid so. They did everything they could to make things work, to make them successful, and they certainly weren't above cheating. The fact that you were allowing the gods to decide uh, your fate didn't mean that you couldn't help them along if you could, if you uh, could help yeah, them yeah, yeah, you know, it, because their idea is that the God works for you, and that's in every aspect of your life, including, of course, your team racing in the Circus Maximus. Yeah. The Romans don't have faith, they just follow the rituals. They have fates. They had fates, quite right, they had fates, not Different faith. Fate. That H makes a big difference. The ancient Romans believed that if you were good to the gods, they would be good to you. Every single event, from winning a chariot race to rolling of the dice, could be the result of divine intervention, a minor miracle. I'm just trying to work out how a couple of millennia of Catholicism might have changed the way the Romans think. Do they still think God will intercede and reward their faith with a royal flush, perhaps? The idea that nothing in our lives happens by chance did not die with the culture of ancient Rome. It remains alive and well in the Chinese philosophy and religion, Taoism. Taoism dates back nearly two millennia. Gods are not the focus of Taoism. The focus is the Tao, the ultimate creative energy of the universe to which we are all connected. This interconnectedness means our fates are all set at birth. So, do Taoists believe miracles are possible? To find out, I'm heading to the heart of the Chinese community in Los Angeles to meet a fourth-generation Taoist fate calculator named Jenny Liu. Jenny Liu? Morgan Freeman? Yes, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Come on in, please. Thank you. So, did you do my life chart? I did. We have you here as June 1st, so 6 1, 1937, 2 a.m. Is that correct? Yeah. Your life map lets us know where over 120 stars are located at your time of birth. These stars configure a certain type of energy field that can impact the quality and success of your life. So in Chinese, we don't call this astrology, actually. We call it fate calculation. Fate, fate calculation. calculation covers your life in 10-year okay. periods. You can see from age 6 to 15 is one, 16 and 25, and so on and so forth. So what now between 7 to 6 and 85? Right now you're in your friendship sector. In your friendship sector, the star that's there is called Wen Tang. This star represents scholars, learned people. These are the people that you want to surround yourselves with. So far, so good. So far, so good. And one of the reasons why maybe you have not come here yet until today is one of the stars in your personal sector is called Lianzhen. And Lianzhen is the adventurer. Somebody who likes to take things as they come. So if my fate is already laid out, does that leave room for, like, miracles? Absolutely. We don't think of astrology chart as predestined, that it's your only fate that's carved in stone. We see a life map, just like we say, life is a journey. And go on any journey, you need to have a map. There's going to be dead ends. There's going to be multiple potholes. But if you know where they are, you're still in charge of your own car. This is just a navigation system. You can turn. If you can understand how you're connected to everything around you, that 
is a miracle waiting to happen. So is this connected to Feng Shui? Feng Shui, this is based on the uh, Taoist thought. Everything around us is connected. Everything is made of energy. We're all connected through this energy. Feng is wind. Sui is water. It's an energy that we cannot destroy or create. It's always there, but we can divert it. We can harness it. In Chinese, we just say, it. we can ride it, exactly. I was going to say, in Chinese, we just say, birds do not fly, they are flown. Fish do not swim, they are carried. They are carried, they are swum by water. We always think, particularly in Christianity, that a miracle is a result of divine intervention. In the Chinese thought, everything is connected. Everything has a reason for it, why it occurred. Thank you. Thank you. Feng Shui. Wind, water. Birds don't fly, they ride the wind. Fish don't swim, they're carried. Everything that happens to us is a result of all the things that we are connected to. What we call divine intervention is merely connections we weren't aware of. Makes me wonder if we shouldn't maybe stop trying so hard to control our lives and learn to ride the wave of life. Our lives are filled with unexpected twists and turns. Some believe there's nothing beyond randomness. Others say we are propelled by the will of God or the energy of the universe. Both those beliefs could make the difference between life and death because the human mind could have a hidden power to unleash a miracle. I'm traveling the world trying to understand the power of miracles. And I've come to Cairo to find out if that power could come from our own minds. I'm visiting one of the world's oldest hospitals, a place that was famous for combining medical science with the healing power of belief. So the writings around the building describe the founding of this hospital and of the entire complex. Harvard historian of Islam and physician Ahmed Bagab has brought me to the Kalawun complex, which first opened its doors around 1285 AD. This would be the entrance through which patients would normally walk. Wow. This is a dramatic change from outside. This is actually by design. When you walk into this corridor, from the outside, the sunny and the dirty streets, and it's very noisy. You walk in here, it's a dark, calm, and shaded corridor. Patients came here hoping to be cured by both cutting edge medicine and a miraculous intervention from God. I want to show you something here. Oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. The construction here is the most impressive thing I've, I think I've seen anywhere. This is the shrine of Sultan Qalawun, the founder of this hospital. Patients would have come in and offer a prayer of thanks for the Sultan. Mm -hmm. Slowly, Qalawun himself becomes connected to the idea of healing. It's like in this history, we're looking at the making of a healing saint. Does that mean that there becomes a connection between faith and healing? Medicine as a whole was seen as the conduit of the will of God. So at the end of the day, we fall sick. Um, in part, this is something that God wills, and we would only be healed through medicine, but only by the will wills. of God. Exactly. So actually, everything that happens is the will of God. Exactly. <laughs> Centuries ago, Muslims believed faith and medicine worked hand in hand. 
But can belief in divine intervention actually help medicine heal us today? Tom Renfro is familiar with the cliché, the miracle of modern medicine, because he's a practicing physician. But he also believes in divine miracles, and that one happened to him. It was 18 years ago that I stood there to give thanks to God for healing me. And what I told you at that time was you are looking at a true miracle, a miracle of God. And I the Hunt for Miracles stories has brought Indiana University scholar Candy Gunter Brown to Norton, Virginia to meet Tom. She's studying whether faith and prayer can actually improve medical outcomes. The question that I, really interests me is what happens when people pray for healing? Well, Candy, it was in 1996, in the fall of that year, that I found a nodule on the back of my neck. Later on that fall, I found more nodules under my arm, and I sought medical attention, and the biopsy under my arm showed that I had an unusual form of lymphoma called mantle cell lymphoma. The prognosis was very poor, and they gave me months to live, and basically told me, enjoy what time you have left. And the goal is to hopefully keep me alive through Christmas. I was a physician. I knew the objective evidence that was there. I was in multi-organ failure. I had a disease that there was no medicine or cure for that would wipe this disease out. Instead of despair, the Lord wants us to remember, I have brought you all this way. I'm not going to leave you here by yourself. Did you have medical treatments? Uh, no, I did not have medical treatments. Not at that time. The tumors continued to progress. And as they progressed, the people came together more and more intense with prayer. Our pastor organized a weekend prayer to where people would come and pray, perhaps even all night. And it was a remarkable time. By now, the tumors were the size of apples on my neck. My arms stuck out because of the massive adenopathy under my arms. My abdomen was expanding. Uh, I was dying. The Lord actually spoke to me and said, now's the time to go to the hospital. Chemotherapy typically only delays the progress of mantle cell lymphoma. It's not a cure. So they started an infusion, and it was like the rock that, that David threw at Goliath. Before the infusion even completed, there was something that changed in me physically. The tumors, they became like a Nerf ball, like a sponge, and very soft. And they started disappearing in front of your eyes. And all this massive adenopathy just disappeared over the next 24, 48 hours. It was gone. Do you ever wonder, did the chemotherapy just work better than the doctors expected it to work? The chemotherapy it wasn't designed to cure. No one expected the tumors to utterly start disappearing or melting. I should have died multiple times during this illness, from pulmonary embolisms, from pneumonia, from renal failure. But I had faith. I had people that poured their words into me to encourage me. And I believe through that that God intervened and healed me. And here we are, 18 years later, me talking to you. To me, that is a miracle. That is a miracle that I'm here. Why did Tom Renfro survive when so many people who pray for healing don't make it? Tom believes the power of his faith and that of the people around him helped the chemotherapy achieve the impossible. It strikes me that much of what we call miraculous 
starts right here in the mind. We close our eyes in prayer, don't we? And I think that's because the goal is to focus the mind, to transcend the distractions of everyday life, to set our minds to achieve what at first we might fear is impossible. I've come to India to explore a religion that believes we all have the mental power to perform miracles. This is the Mahabodhi Temple in Bodh Gaya. According to Buddhist tradition, 2,500 years ago, a man named Siddhartha Gautama came to the realization that the human mind had immense untapped powers. In doing so, he founded an entirely new religion, Buddhism. And tradition says he did it right here under this tree. I want to understand what Buddhists believe happened to Siddhartha as he sat under the tree. Tibetan monk Losang Tenpa has promised to help me find out. So, that's the way I'm, I'm glad you could come. Oh, me too. Uh, I am so too. this is our holiest spot where the Buddha attained awakening. Losang tells me he'll get me to understand the miracle of the Buddha's enlightenment, and he'll do it by challenging my mind to get me to see the light myself. So what do you know about what do you know so about Lord Buddha? I mean, uh, what do they well, teach you in America? Uh, I learned that he was of noble birth, yeah, and uh, he grew up very, very sheltered. And, said that. and then one day he wandered out of the compound. That's right. And began to see the life world. as it really was. Yep. Why, why, why did he do that? That's the question you're going to answer. Well, how would you like it if your father had decided as soon as you were born that this baby of mine is going to be the king? So I've got to keep him in this palace, surrounded by beautiful sense objects, Sounds flowers perfect. that never droop, beautiful young ladies Sounds who never perfect. look old. Sounds perfect. Isn't that perfect? It yeah. Sounds, but sounds this guy wasn't good. satisfied with that. Buddha left the palace, right? Yes. And do you know what he saw when he left the palace? Well, uh, as I understand it, he, he saw suffering. He saw real life. In what was, form? In what form? Well, there were old people. Cripples, yeah. uh, uh, beggars, yeah. people who had nothing, people who were hungry. Yeah, it's, like, a, it's like an eye opener. It's eye like a wow. He saw death. Yeah. His, oh, father, saw death his father didn't want him to see death. It made him think so strongly. He felt, I've got to leave this place I've, I've and find it. out what is the cause of this. Why do people suffer? Siddhartha roamed for six years seeking to understand the cause of suffering until he finally came to the shade of a ficus tree and decided that he would stay right on that spot, focusing his mind until he discovered how to end human suffering. After sitting motionless for an entire night, Siddhartha achieved a mental transformation. Buddhists say he became the Buddha, the enlightened one. He taught us he said, you know, what a good doctor would tell a patient. Man, you're sick. You're sick. You're suffering. You know, you have a problem. Second, I know the cause. Basically, this craving, attachment. The Buddha realized that by letting go of his desires and his attachment to the material world, he could rid himself of suffering. For the Buddha and for generations of Buddhists after him, this freedom from attachment seems to allow a remarkable, perhaps even miraculous, mental and physical focus. You know, he was so grateful to this tree under which he'd sat and achieved this amazing realization. He sat in this area for seven weeks, and for one of those weeks, just gazing unwinkingly, they say. Unmoving and unblinking for seven days. Uh, it's possible, why not? We happen to exercise our minds. 
we're so busy with external things, buying and selling and doing all the things we do. You've never actually seen a yogi in, yeah. in action? Well, in a sense, it's an amazing thing, but you and I can do it. For Buddhists, years of mental training and showing love and compassion to others can free them from suffering. Walking around this temple, you feel like a miracle really could happen. The miracle of people being content with their lives, people getting along together. Do you want to just come and see how a Tibetan yeah. Lama teaches Western students? Sure. How are you? I am well. How are you, sir? Very good. I saw your movie. Oh, you did? Which one? <laughs> I don't know. Who else likes my movie? <laughs> <laughs> Shortcut. We all need to care and love and respect each other. That is the source of happiness. Whoever had that, their journey is good. Whoever not keep this in heart, journey is not good. Thank you. From today, you are my friend. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Steve. I like you. I love you. <laughs> so, a lot of religions are pretty much miracle based. I mean, Christianity, Judaism. Right. Really. Right. Uh, you don't do miracles? But what's a miracle? I mean, flying in the sky, is that a miracle? It Birds is, do it. it is, it Birds is. But we normally think of miracles as some sort of divine thing, something that, okay. that gives us proof of God or something, you know? Okay, so that we could ask, where's God? We ask the mystics or the yogis, where's God? They'll, they'll point here, they won't point up there. They'll say it's in here. So then, if you're being inspired by your inner God, Buddha, Christ, you know, Krishna, whatever you want to call it, maybe then you can perform what's called a miracle. What does this world need the most? It needs healing, right? Love. It needs uh, reconciliation. I think that's a miracle, and that's the miracle we need. We don't need people levitating three inches off their butt, you know, while meditating. That's stupid. Right so right. let's stick to the real miracle, which is to transform the human mind, really. All right. You know what you just did? What? You solved the problem of miracles. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good walk up. <laughs> nice. You're all right in my yeah. book. It's ironic. That a man who wanted us to tap into the power that we all have within ourselves is thought of as some sort of divine being. The point of Buddhism, as far as I can see, is to teach us that we are all capable of much more than we might believe we are. We just concentrate on it, just put our minds to it. I used to struggle to make sense of miracle stories, how oceans could be parted, how it was possible to walk on water. But I think I was missing the point. To believe in miracles is to believe there is more to life than meets the eye, to accept there could be something that connects us, unites us. So many souls pass through this world and as our paths cross, miraculous things can and do happen. People get the breaks they always wanted. People inspire one another. People fall in love. And whether these events are orchestrated by the hand of God, the power of the mind, or just a one in a million chance, I believe we should believe in miracles. Because miracles, however you define them, help us to 
Well, they give us hope. They drive us to create reality out of possibility.